Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so we're going to finish up chapter nine here today. Oh, I forgot to put on. Um, a few things about the test. Um, scores looking good. So the average on midterm four is looking to be about 80% for our class, which is, I think, pretty good. Um, hopefully heading into the final, um, everybody is kind of rebounding towards, uh, you know, hopefully being able to do as good as we possibly can do on the final. The final, final exam will be cumulative. We will do some reviewing here in class. I'll set up another review session or like a Q&A session. I'll probably do it on Zoom. I really like the way the Zoom session went um, with the ability to ask like a lot of questions uh, in the chat feed throughout it. So we'll probably set up some type of Zoom. I'll let you know when that will be as we get closer to the final exam. But just know that we're going to have to start reviewing chapters, you know, one through nine. We're still working in nine, obviously. But we're going to have to review the earlier chapters um, as we head into the final exam. Okay, so heading back into chapter nine here. The last topic has to do with molecular orbital theory um, in terms of a slightly different bonding model that's similar to hybrid orbital theory, uh, but a little bit different in terms of um, how we look at um, the, the, the theory. So let's get into molecular orbitals. So the idea of why we get a bond between H2, we were looking for hybrid orbital theory for the idea that you just kind of had an unpaired electron. So you just had hydrogen with an unpaired electron, another hydrogen, and then we make a bond between the two. And so the idea was that we can sort of put two electrons into some sort of a bonding orbital. And then we also had the idea that once you had something that already had two electrons, like if we're looking at helium, bonding with helium, that helium already has two electrons and it doesn't really need to exchange electrons. So it's already kind of has its orbital filled with two electrons, so helium is likely not going to form a bond with itself. Molecular orbital theory will give us a similar picture for why we get a bond between two H atoms, but not a bond between two helium atoms. And so, but it gives us a picture of something we call anti-bonding orbitals versus bonding orbitals. So we take two 1s orbitals, and they can overlap together, kind of the same picture from hybrid orbital theory. And so the orbitals overlap together, give us the bonding contribution down, and then anti-bonding going up. And so you get a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. Sort of the idea, if you're going to have stabilization, you have to have destabilization um, in terms of the anti-bonding orbital. And so for hydrogen, the good news is it only has two electrons. So we put two electrons into the bonding orbital, and then we don't need to put any into the anti-bonding orbital. So there's no electrons for hydrogen that need to go into the anti-bonding orbital. So for H2, there's two electrons that we're filling into this orbital, and it's sort of like we have orbital number one and then orbital number two that can hold each of them two electrons. So we're only putting two electrons into a bonding orbital. And so that kind of describes almost the same picture that we had from hybrid theory, that the overlapping oneness orbitals gives you a bonding orbital. And then even though you could picture perhaps helium's 1s orbitals overlapping because they're filled with electrons, for helium 2, we'll see this on the next slide, that for helium 2, if we're trying to picture um, for um, helium 2, why it doesn't form a stable molecule, it's because we have to put four electrons in. Each helium has two electrons. So helium-2 has four electrons. And so we're putting four electrons, two into a bonding, two in, into an anti-bonding orbital. So there's no net stabilization for helium to exchange its electrons to form helium-2. So we're going down. And if you go down by x, you go up by more than x. So if you notice that the anti-bonding orbitals are even a little bit higher up than the bonding orbital was down, so it's not even that you get no net sta uh, stabilization, you actually get a destabilization if you try to make a molecule like helium-2. So helium-2, the issue is we could put two electrons here, but the other two electrons are going here on the outside of the molecule. Another way of thinking of this is if you have two electrons spinning around an atom, like helium, you have another atom, then you could bring two electrons together, but the other two electrons are pulling the atoms back apart. And so we have two electrons in a bonding, orbital versus two electrons in an anti-bonding orbital, leading to no net bond forming between the two atoms. And so we have another definition for bond order. We were looking at bond order previously as single bonds being one, double being two, triple being three, just kind of being the number of pairs of electrons that are being shared. Within MO theory, we can calculate bond order by taking you know, one half of the difference between the total bonding electrons and then subtracting the anti-bonding electrons. 
And so since we're counting total number of electrons here, that's why we're cutting them in half to go to sort of a pair. Two electrons being exchanged would be a single bond. So if we do this for H2, so the bond order for H2 from its MO diagram would be equal to one half, two bonding electrons, and then minus zero antibonding electrons. So that gives us a single bond exactly what we would have expected for H2. And so, of course, our description of H2 is still with a single bond. Uh, one other detail would be that the bond here, this, is this a sigma bond or a pi bond? That just like from hybrid orbital theory, because our um, orbital is on the bond axis, it's symmetrical about the bond axis, that's a sigma bond. And we'll see some pi bonds in a minute, but a pi bond would look like a planar type bond. So these don't look like planar bonds. These are bond symmetric. So these um, orbitals are symmetrical about our bond axis. And then if we look at the bond order of helium, of helium two, it would be a half and then two bonding electrons minus two anti-bonding electrons for zero. And so when we get a bond order of zero, this means that there's no stable bond between those two atoms. And so that's why helium-2 doesn't exist as a diatomic molecule that we've talked about. So two helium atoms would just deflect off each other, wouldn't actually form this bond. Now, there's an interesting reason why we're telling you this story about MO theory. And I think if not for this, we probably wouldn't even be talking about this theory right now. And that is, if you're looking at oxygen, molecular oxygen O2, we can actually do this demo. I was going to try to do it today, but we'll do it Friday just to show you this in person. Kind of, you take liquid oxygen and you pass it through a magnetic field, it's actually sticking between two magnets. And you may think, well, what's the big deal here? Well, if you think about what it means to be, you know, paramagnetic, if you recall, we talked about paramagnetism a little bit in chapter seven, when we had um, cations that had unpaired electrons, we did a demo where we had some salts that were being pulled into a magnetic field because they had unpaired electrons. So being para paramagnetic, this is telling us that O2 has unpaired electrons. So being paramagnetic means we have one or more unpaired electrons in the molecule. If something's diamagnetic, then it would have all spin paired electrons and would not be drawn into a magnetic field. And so what the picture is showing us is that O2 is paramagnetic because it's being pulled into that magnetic field. We'll show you this next time with the demo, but N2 is not paramagnetic. So if we look at N2, so we pour um, sort of nitrogen in between a magnet, that N2 is not paramagnetic. So we'll observe it not to be pulled into a magnetic field. That's another way of saying it's diamagnetic. So a substance is either pulled into a magnetic field, it is paramagnetic, or it's not. And then it's called diamagnetic. And so something that's diamagnetic has all of its electrons been paired. And then O2 has at least one or more unpaired electrons. So we say O2 has unpaired electrons. And now, again, like if you're thinking about it, well, what's the big deal there? Well, think about O2 for a minute. If we're thinking O2 from what we just talked about from hybrid orbital theory, or even with the idea of spin paired versus unpaired electrons, don't these electrons in our Lewis structure look like they'd be spin paired? And if these are spin paired, then how do we end up with spin unpaired electrons? I'm trying to draw all these spin up, spin down. So another consequence of hybrid orbital theory, if you think about O2, if we're looking at O2 and saying this is sp2 hybridized, so we may have looked at each of these O's and say, okay, they're sp2 hybrids, and then we'd have our hybrid sp2 orbitals pointing at each other. We'd have the p orbital with an electron making a pi bond. So a double bond should be a sigma and a pi. So hybrid orbital theory would be saying O2 likely would have a sigma bond, that's unpaired electron, that's spin up, spin down, that's two electrons in an orbital. We'd have a pi bond, that's a spin up, spin down combination, that's two electrons in an orbital. Then we'd have um, the other sp2 orbitals with our lone pairs, which for, you know, would seem to be that they should be spin paired. 
So if you're looking at hybrid orbital theory, you don't get a picture that shows the electrons in O2 being unpaired. And so this model here turns out to be wrong from hybrid orbital theory. So I think that's where MO theory is stepping in. It's saying, OK, there's actually this property of oxygen that if we're just looking at the Lewis structure, if we're looking at hybrid orbital theory, we're not quite seeing why it is oxygen has unpaired electrons. So we need a better model that's going to show us why oxygen has these net electrons. It actually has two electrons that are uh, spin paired into the same direction. So let's look at why that's the case um, using MO theory. And so to kind of get towards O2, let's start with kind of the next two elements in the periodic table. If we think H2, helium-2, uh, move to lithium-2, beryllium-2. So for lithium-2, you're thinking just like hydrogen, it has one valence electron uh, for each of its atoms. And so for picturing lithium-2, it's like imagine that you have the overlap of two small s orbitals and then two larger s orbitals. So for lithium-2, it's almost like we're trying to picture having one lithium that looks like this, where we have two electrons, one electron around one lithium atom, the other lithium has its nucleus, one s orbital, and the bigger 2s shell. So you're probably going to get the larger bonding and antibonding contributions from the larger 2s valence shell orbitals. So if you're thinking of the minus x and the plus slightly greater than x, you're going to get a bigger contribution from the 2s orbitals. And then this down here is going to be smaller versus not as high upward for um, the 1s orbitals, because they're smaller, they're not going to overlap as well together. In fact, as we move along, we're not even going to talk about the valence shell overlap. So this will probably be the last slide where we actually see the 1s orbitals. We're going to kind of cut them off as we move into looking at the valence shell orbitals and things like O2, N2, and what they're doing to make their molecular orbitals. But if you're thinking of 1s, you get some sort of bonding versus anti-bonding orbitals from the 1s with a small bonding, anti-bonding contribution. And then for lithium-2, we have two more electrons going into the sigma uh, 2s orbital. So we kind of have a bonding orbital, anti-bonding orbital, then a bonding orbital. And so this, um, in blue here, this is our anti-bonding orbital, then in red are our two bonding orbitals. So for lithium-2, where in terms of a valence count, we probably think this is something like H2, where we have two, unpaired, uh, two electrons that can spin pair together, and that's what the MO diagram is kind of showing us for lithium-2. And so we end up with a single bond because our bond order would be equal to one half. We have four bonding electrons, the ones squared in red, um, so these were the red electrons, and then minus the two that were the antibonding electrons that were in the blue box. And of course, that difference gives us a bond order of one for a single bond. So we get a single bond between two lithium atoms. And if I go to beryllium two, I don't think this is the next slide, but let me think about the difference here between um, lithium two versus beryllium two. If I change these to beryllium, what do we do different? Well, we have to add an extra electron, and then we fill two electrons into the sigma star 2s, that antibonding orbital. So what signifies an orbital as being bonding is the star symbol, and then the sigma is the type of bonds. We have sigma bonds, and then the little label here, 2s versus 1s, is just what are the native orbitals that are making up the orbital. So we have sigma 1s, sigma 1s star. Those are the bonding, antibonding from the 1s orbitals. Then sigma bonding 2s, and then sigma star 2s. So no star means bonding, and then the star means we have an bon anti-bonding orbital. So the idea is bonding's bringing the electrons, the, the nuclei together, the anti-bond's breaking the bond. And so the bond order for beryllium-2, so if we're looking at the bond order for beryllium-2, of course it's a half, four, minus four for zero. So there's no net bond we'd expect to form between two beryllium atoms. So we'd expect uh, now, beryllium can form a solid, it is a solid at room temperature, so it's going to find a way to bond still together, but just two distinct beryllium atoms together, we're not going to expect to find a bond between those atoms, but we would between two lithium atoms. And sort of the, um, we're, we're trying to bridge the gap of going from sort of an atom and another atom and bringing them together and thinking of how their orbitals will interact with each other. And so far, we've only had S orbitals that are interacting with each other. When we get across into you know, N2 and O2, those atoms are going to have P orbitals as well. And so as we start thinking about atoms that are going to be interacting with each other, where we're going to have access to the 2S and the 2P set of orbitals, and we're going to have 
you know, maybe something like, like the first one would be diboron. So the next element after beryllium is boron. And so if we're thinking about the interaction or the diagram for diboron, we're kind of starting with the idea that it has electrons in 2s and 2p orbitals. And then if we go to, um, you know, N2, uh, or excuse me, um, carbon would be next. But um, if we're thinking carbon, we're putting more electrons into the 2p shell. So we're putting more electrons into the 2p shell. So we need to involve the 2p orbitals and think about how they're going to interact with each other. And so we can see, well, I'll go through these pictures in a minute, but before I get into these pictures here, let's just try to picture having, you know, an atom like carbon, where we're going to have a 2s orbital, we're going to have a 2p orbital, we're going to have another 2p orbital. And we have a third 2p orbital I'm going to ignore for now, just because it'll make it easier to not sketch the third 2p orbital. And so this is just looking at one of the carbon atoms, let's say in C2, and then we have another carbon atom, we have a 2s, a 2p. Also notice I've neglected the 1s, like I mentioned. So we're not worrying about the 1s orbital anymore. So we're just worrying about the valence shell, 2s and 2p orbitals. And so the other carbon looks something like this. And so these, uh, these orbitals are representing electrons that are spinning around those nuclei. So the p orbital is spinning around like this or like this if it's vertical. So the p orbitals themselves, one of the things you might think is that can we pick up an orbital and like change its directions? Can I take a carbon nucleus here and put a 2p orbital? Here? Like we can't do that, right? The, the orbitals are kind of locked into place to being where they are centered around their nuclei. We can maybe bend them. Um, we're going to forget about the whole idea of them mixing. So we're going to forget for a moment about hybridization and making sp2 or sp3 orbitals. So don't worry about or think about the orbitals mixing and changing shape like we were earlier. But just think about how these orbitals, when they're adjacent to each other, can interact. And I think you can see pretty clearly that the 2p orbitals that are going to overlap like this can lock together, form an overlap, form a bond. And so that's this picture here. And so this picture here is showing you that two orbitals, the thing that this diagram I think makes it a little bit confusing is the center of the dots of the two nuclei. And so as those two nuclei are being brought together, then the p orbitals that are on the same axis together can interact. And so this type of bond here, this is a sigma bond. This is the bond axis symmetric because that's the bond axis of our molecule. So we're making a bond symmetrical about the bond axis. And so that's a sigma bond. And so just like we get bonding and antibonding contribution, we get that for these two p orbitals as well. So we get a bonding orbital, and then we get the antibonding orbital. And so the antibonding orbital, it's putting the electron density more away from the nuclei. It's kind of the idea is you can have electrons spinning like this, where they're meeting in the middle. Then if we had two more electrons in that orbital, they'd be over here. And, and so our antibonding orbital bringing the nuclei away from each other, the bonding orbitals are bringing the nuclei together. And so the idea of bonding for most molecules, the more electrons we can put into bonding orbitals, the better. The fewer we can put into antibonding orbitals, the better, because the antibonding orbitals are trying to separate the nuclei, the bonding orbitals are bringing the nuclei together. And now in terms of this picture here, of the relative energies of these orbitals, like, and, like you can't really have predicted this too easily. Like maybe you can imagine the idea that the 2s and the 2p have a different energy. So imagine our axis here is energy. And so we know from chapter six that the 2s orbital is more stable than the 2p set of orbitals. And so if we're going to get or, uh, overlap between the 2s, probably not going to be very big. And then, so we get the 2s orbitals kind of interacting and exchanging up and down in terms of their bonding versus anti-bonding contribution. So this is these orbitals here. Let me circle these in red. So it's these two orbitals here overlapping with each other, forming a bonding versus an anti-bonding contribution. And the up and down here is not where the electrons are moving. It's just where the relative energy goes. So the bonding leads the energy to go downward, and the anti-bonding is a net destabilization. And so I'm going to fill electrons in like later slides, but, or maybe I can start filling them in here too. That's okay. But if I'm thinking about putting for like dicarbon, um, so for C2, I'm, I need to put eight electrons into this diagram. I'm going to start with two, four. Just the idea of like Hund's rule, uh, poly exclusion principle. I just want to put max two electrons per orbital, and I want to have a spin up versus spin down into each orbital, not two up or two down or anything like that. So I want to still apply my rules from chapter six in terms of how I'm filling electrons into these diagrams. And then I get the, um, uh, whether or not, these two orbitals we're going to see in a minute kind of will have 
a slightly different order depending on if the molecules in a certain region of the periodic table. So we need to look carefully kind of at how these two orbitals kind of will exchange their energies relative to each other in a way that's not easy to predict. But the idea is that uh, we're going to fill electrons kind of in order from high to low. In fact, for C2, we're gonna see that for C2, these 2p orbitals here actually end up being lower in energy and the sigma 2p is higher. But we'll talk about that in a minute. That's a finer detail that will make more sense in a couple slides from now. But if I'm being correct, the next two electrons are going to go into this orbital here for C2. If I'm filling the next two electrons in and it turns out that this orbital is more stable, I'm gonna write it down here, not here. I put my two electrons spin paired for the next two and then put my next four in because I'm just putting the electrons in from low energy to high energy. And so what these orbitals look like though, these two, like the, the orbitals I'm putting in here that I move from here, they look like these contributions. It's these orbitals here overlapping that are now making the planar type bond. And so the two P orbitals that look like this, and the two that I didn't sketch are sticking straight out of the page, it looks similar are overlapping in the planar direction. So these two orbitals here are going to overlap in this direction here. They're going to make a bond that looks something like this. That's our pi 2p. Now it's a pi instead of a sigma because that's a pi bond. So we get a pi 2p orbital here. And then we get the um, pi star 2p for the, the electrons then breaking and being on the opposite side. So think about how the pi electrons just kind of move like this relative to each of the carbon nuclei. So that's our bonding contribution. So that's what ends up looking like this. And then we have the anti-bonding contribution where I have my two carbon nuclei and then the p orbitals are bending this direction, kind of being pulled in together and then breaking apart. And so th that's our anti-bonding contribution. So if we're putting electrons up here, we're putting electrons into those anti-bonding orbitals. And so the idea is our sigma goes down, our sigma 2p goes up. Our highest orbital overall is our sigma star 2p, the antibonding orbital for the symmetrical, bond symmetrical axis 2p. And then our pi is the next highest, our pi star 2p. Now, we'll give you some base diagrams. There's not going to be a lot of memorization here. You'll see in a minute. Hopefully that'll make sense. Yeah. Yeah, like, let me come, let me get to another slide or two away from this diagram here. Because this diagram, like, the, these two orbitals will change the spots. And we need to see why that is, or kind of compare these, two, like, like, and it's, it's so cluttered on this diagram of what's really going on here. But then for C2, the idea is, and, and maybe we can make sense of this on this slide here too, that what's going on over here are just the two carbon atoms. So we're just trying to picture on the outside periphery what the two C atoms look like before they overlap with each other. And then the middle is meant to represent the relative energies of the molecular orbitals once those atoms overlap. So the middle here, this is all C2 in the middle. And then we have our C atoms on the outside. Okay, and so then we get two orbitals that look like the pi. So there's two different orbitals. So we have three p orbitals. We have the sigma and we get the pi, one pi and then the other pi. So we get the um, three p orbitals for on each of the two carbon atoms can either overlap to make um, um, one type of sigma bond. So one sigma, one sigma star, and then one pi and a, and a second pi. So we get two pi bonding orbitals and then two pi anti-bonding orbitals. So that is we're just, we're looking at diagrams that look kind of like this. As I go from lithium two to beryllium two. You could imagine for lithium-2 and beryllium-2 kind of comparing the relative energies of their empty 2p shell orbitals. So for um, lithium-2 and beryllium-2, you can kind of start to picture that, that there's some labels over here, and I'll rewrite them up here, that you, you have your sigma-2s, your sigma-star 2s. And again, we've neglected the sigma-1s and the sigma-1s star that we were showing originally with the lithium-2 and beryllium-2. So for lithium-2, it looks like we would have this. For beryllium-2, we would have this structure. And if we're thinking of order for lithium two, still a bond order of one for lithium two, and then we go back to zero because we're putting two into an antibonding orbital. Um, so for the bond order for beryllium two would be zero. And then look at how these orbitals here are interacting 
with the different nuclei. So if you notice, most of the orbitals are becoming more stable because the orbitals have electrons in them with, which are negatively charged. And as you go left to right, the effect of charge is increasing. So as we go from left to right, from lithium to beryllium to boron, et cetera, the nuclear charge is increasing, the effective charge is increasing. So the, en the energy of attraction of the electrons in those orbitals to the nuclei is increasing. So we're getting a stabilization. So the reason why you're seeing a downward trend for these orbitals is that they're becoming closer towards a more positive charge. So a, a stronger attractive force is stabilizing those orbitals. And so notice, that the sigma 2p has a pretty big switch here to here where it ends up dropping below the pi 2p. The pi 2p orbitals, you might imagine that why are these orbitals not so impacted by um, the left to right trend? And it's probably because they're pretty far away from where the nuclear charge is. The pi orbitals are putting electron density here, the nuclei is here. And so the pi orbitals are kind of putting electrons kind of not exactly where the nuclear charge is. So they're not really dependent so much on the nuclear charge. If you notice the pi set of orbitals, pretty similar in terms of their energy from left to right. And you get this big switch where the pi 2p are more stable than the sigma 2p. So this bond here is our sigma 2p and the pi 2p is the one that's the doubly. So the two orbitals that are equal in energy, we call that degenerate. So if you can spot the two orbitals, that are the same as each other in energy, that's the pi set because you get pi, p orbital number one, p orbital number two, giving you exactly identical looking orbitals, orbitals of equal energy. So those are our pi orbitals. And then the sigma 2p happens to drop below the energy of those pi sets for O2, F2, and neon two. So, as, so what we can do is we can start to fill electrons into these orbitals and just see what do the configurations look like? What do their bond orders look like? And then can we predict some magnetic properties? Like can we start to see which of these molecules actually has unpaired electrons versus which ones don't have unpaired electrons? And then um, lastly, when we like get to test, we're gonna give you some like base diagrams. We'll see those in another slide or two from now in terms of what you get on exams where I don't really expect that you memorize what this chart looks like because that seems kind of peculiar to memorize what this diagram looks like. But the idea will be, can you fill electrons into things that look like this chart? So if I go to B2, for B2, the issue is the number of electrons we're putting into these molecules, two for lithium, two, four for beryllium, two. We got to go six for B2, just because each beryllium has uh, uh, three valence electrons, so six total. So we're going two, four, and then six. And so the fact for B2 leads to an orbital that has equal, two orbitals of equal energy, it means I got to follow Hund's rule and put the electrons paired in the same direction. So I have to follow Hund's rule here. So B2 has a net bond order of one, because if you notice bond, anti-bond, so I only have two net bonding electrons, so my bond order is one. Does anybody want me to just, like, I mean, I can show this equation here. It's just one half, four bonding electrons, two anti-bonding. And just to make sure we're seeing, these are the, anti, uh, these are the bonding electrons here, and then these are the anti-bonding electrons just to make sure we're seeing how we're counting the net bond order. But the bond's really peculiar here. Like if I were to ask you for B2, like what does it look like? You might say, well, it probably just looks something like this in terms of like a Lewis diagram, which makes kind of sense, right? It shows a single bond, shows two electrons, but that single bond is actually like two halves of a pi bond. You know, so it's not, it's, it's a weird bond that's not putting electron density on the nuclear axis. It's actually putting nuclear density above and below the bond. And so this is actually where the net bond is actually, and I don't think we would ever ask you this, but the net bond in B2 is actually a pi bond because we have two electrons in pi orbitals, not in sigma orbitals. And so our net bond here is actually a pi bond, but that's just peculiar for B2. But the more important property I think for B2 is that it's paramagnetic, where we have diamagnetic for these two. If I could write even remotely legibly. So we have diamagnetic molecules for, uh, so no unpaired electrons for lithium-2 or beryllium-2. And beryllium-2 probably doesn't even exist. So you probably can't pull something into a magnetic field that doesn't even exist as a bond. So lithium-2 not going to be pulled into a magnetic field. Beryllium-2 would probably never exist to even be possible to pull it into anything. So what about C2? So we're going to put eight electrons into dicarbon. So we're just putting eight electrons in. 
And if you can imagine, we're almost like trying to build towards O2. Like the big, like the big reveal will be, well, what does O2 look like? But we're getting to C2, and C2 has a bond order of two. So I have six bonding electrons, two anti-bonding electrons, so my bond order here is two. So a, a, a good Lewis structure for dicarbon would probably be something like this. It shows eight total electrons. We have each carbon's neutral and formal charge. Um, the, uh, so if you're thinking for carbon, should it, you might have wondered, according to our Lewis structure rule, if you go back to chapter eight, we said for diatomic, satisfy the octet rule. For dicarbon, that would have been a quadruple bond. But what you can see here, according to MO theory, we can't quite get a quadruple bond between two atoms because of the existence of this antibonding orbital. So because we have an antibonding orbital means we are going to have sort of two electrons here, two electrons here, those cancel out. These cancel out into what look like our lone pair electrons. So when you see a bond and an antibond with two electrons each, those are kind of like, like leading to what we think of as being lone pair electrons because there's no net bond there. So then a net bond for dicarbon, again, probably not a good, like it would be an interesting test question, but probably not one we would ever ask, but describe the bond in dicarbon. Is it a sigma and a pi? It actually turns out to be a weird case that we would probably say it's better described as being two pi bonds just because the net bond here are pi bonds. So it's a weird bond where the two bonds, like the double bond is not a sigma and a pi, um, but just remember the prediction, if we said according to hybrid orbital theory, what do you expect? Hybrid orbital theory would say probably would be a sigma and a pi bond because each carbon would probably be like an sp2 hybrid or something like that. Or maybe um, um, that's how we would picture it within hybrid orbital theory. Uh, but within MO theory, we would say, well, actually, we can see that there's actually two net pi bonds there, not a sigma and a pi. Okay, but again, not a very big detail, but something to point out there in terms of the net bond, what it's described by. Now let's look at N2. So for N2, we now just got to put 10 electrons around the atom. Switch back to this color. So we're putting two, four, six, eight, and then 10 electrons into N2. And so N2 kind of beautifully puts all of its electrons maximally into bonding orbitals. It doesn't have to put any electrons into anti-bonding orbitals up here. So these are our last set of anti-bonding orbitals, which it leaves empty. And then so nitrogen, we know it's a stable molecule. It's, you know, in our atmosphere, it doesn't really hardly react with anything in the atmosphere. And so we have our nitrogen uh, with a net bond order of three, really strong triple bond, really short bond uh, because it's triple. Um, and then it's also, um, and both of these molecules here would be diamagnetic because neither one of them have unpaired electrons. So if you remember, we started off saying O2 is drawn into the magnetic field. Uh, but if you do the similar experiment with N2, it's not drawn into a magnetic field. So we're correctly predicting the magnetic property of N2 with MO theory. So that's good so far. Um, we're also showing it has a net bond order of three. So the bond order is triple, which matches what we expect for N2 to look like a triple bond. And again, the sort of bonding, anti-bonding orbitals lead to our lone pairs. And then we have our net triple bond. And now this is looking like what hybrid orbital theory would predict too, a sigma and two pi bonds. So finally for N2, we get a good match between what hybrid orbital theory, uh, Lewis structure theory would show as thinking of a sigma bond, two pi bonds. Um, so good agreement between hybrid orbital theory and N2. And then we finally get to really the, the whole point of the story I think is O2. So I think the, the whole reason we're telling you the story is to hopefully get O2 right to understand why it has unpaired electrons. And so we're filling 12 electrons in for O2, two, four, six, eight, 10 but it has two more that have to go into the next higher set of orbitals, which is that pi 2p star orbital. And so now O2, you may be surprised at first glance, I think you're like, how is it possible that O2 is relatively stable? I would think we could say it's stable because it, you know, it's stable enough to exist in our atmosphere. Um, but O2 has two electrons in an antibonding orbital. And you may have thought that just seems strange that a stable molecule would have electrons in an antibonding orbital. But O2 does, and it's still stable nevertheless. And then these two electrons have to be paired in the same direction because they're going into equal energy orbitals. Hund's rule says those electrons should be paired into the same direction, and that should give O2 a net spin. So the, the reason why O2 is drawn into the magnetic field is it has these two net spin electrons that give the molecule a net spin. So you apply a magnetic field, those electron pairs are drawn into that field. They pull O2 into the field. So O2 is paramagnetic, like we expected from its observation 
from actually being drawn into a magnetic field. So from the actual test of being paramagnetic, it is. So the experimental observation holds up. And then, well, what about the bond order? Do we at least have the double bond right for O2? And we at least have that right with MO theory, or, or excuse me, with hybrid orbital theory and our Lewis structure theory. And so we get a bond order of two. How do I get this bond order of two here? So for O2, our bond order would be one half and then um, bonding electrons, let me circle these in red. So our bonding electrons are these electrons here. They're all the electrons in the orbitals without the star symbol. So it's the sigma 2s, the sigma 2p, pi 2p electrons. So the most bonding electrons we're ever going to get in a molecule is eight. And then we're gonna subtract the number of antibonding electrons. And so we have these two antibonding electrons and then these two antibonding electrons. And so that gives us a net of four antibonding electrons for a bond order of two. So at least our bond order of two is correct. And the issue with O2 is probably more the idea that you kind of made what was a triple bond, but then you canceled out the triple bond with two unpaired electrons. So it's kind of, I think, you know, maybe almost like if you picture O2 like we did before, but just where you end up with that last bond with instead of spin paired electrons, you end up with two net electrons paired in the same direction. So you just end up somehow creating O2 that has two net paired electrons somehow. That's hard to draw through any Lewis structure. It's really hard to show a Lewis structure of O2 that would kind of depict those unpaired electrons. And so, uh, you know, one possible way of showing a Lewis structure, and again, I don't think we'd ever ask you to show a Lewis structure for O2 because it's kind of hard to picture, but maybe we would show something like this where we have you know, spin paired electrons, and then these are spin. You know, so somehow we have to have two net electrons in the same direction. And so if we stop thinking of all the electrons as being pairs on O2 might be one way to think of that. So the non-bonding electrons on O2 probably aren't actually paired up together like we would have thought with um, hybrid orbital theory and the way we were sketching our MOs. Okay, so MO theory correctly showing, we get two unpaired electrons correctly showing oxygen's paramagnetic and expected to be drawn into a magnetic field. If we just finish off this diagram for the last two molecules, going 14 and 16 electrons, so we go two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So we just put two more electrons in for F2. So F2 would appear to be relatively stable even with four electrons in pi star orbitals, has a net bond order of one. We've now just increased this up to six anti-bonding electrons. We have a net bond order of one for F2. And then if we get to, and, and it would be all electrons been paired. So this would go back to being diamagnetic. And so we'd have diamagnetic, but paramagnetic for oxygen. And then for neon two, for dineon, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons. Now it goes to eight minus eight, no net bond forming between um, di neon. So neon two, bond order would be zero. So no net bond forming. This would be, hope everything's okay in there. So no net bond forming between the noble gas helium atoms. Okay, so now what do we want you to take away from this? I think it's going to be just how do you sort of understand how to designate what orbitals are represented by in terms of sigma versus pi, and then 2s versus 2p, and then uh, bonding versus anti-bonding, and then can we fill electrons into orbitals? And so um, this is just showing you a, a picture out of the book, kind of comparing a few details of B2, C2, just kind of summarizing what we had in the previous page. And so going from a bond order one to two to three for B2, C2 to N2, notice that our pi, uh, pi 2p is filled before the sigma 2p with electrons. And then we're getting our magnetic properties. Notice as you're going from single to double to triple that the bond length is shortening. So notice that N2 here has the shortest bond. And so you can compare when atoms are in the same row, you can certainly say that triple bonds are shorter than double bonds, shorter than single bonds in, in terms of length. And then you reverse that trend in terms of strength. And so the trend would reverse in that triple bonds are stronger than double bonds are stronger than single bonds in terms of strength. So if you look at the bond strengths here, the bond energy for N2 is a lot higher. And so you have a higher bond energy for the triple bond, higher energy for the double compared to the single. And then you kind of do the opposite of the trend as you go O2 to F2 to neon two. So you go back to being a double bond. So you go to 
O2 now being longer than N2 because it's a double instead of a triple bond. And so we lengthen the bond as we go here. Neon 2, of course, doesn't have a bond, so it doesn't exist or have any properties associated with it. And then um, um, F2, shorter bond, weaker bond. So we're going to weaker bonds as we go away from being triple at N2. So all of our bond strength and length trends kind of still fall in line with the bond order. So the bond order is still kind of telling us triple bonds are the shortest, double are um, longer, single are the longest, et cetera, for our molecules. One other thing that's kind of interesting is you can actually take two orders that are the same, like C2 and O2, and ask which one's longer versus which one's shorter. So which of those two would you expect has the longer bond? They both have double bonds. So the key would be if you're comparing C double bond C versus O double bond O, you can just sort of look at the periodic trend that carbon is bigger than oxygen from left to right. So when you're comparing two bonds that have the same order or the same type, so if you're comparing two single bonds, if you're comparing two double bonds, the question is just, well, which atom is bigger? And so it just comes down to the fact that from left to right, carbon is bigger than oxygen from our atomic radii trend. So using our left to right atomic radii trend, carbon's bigger, so the C2 bond should be longer. And if you notice, the C2 bond's like 1.31 angstrom versus 1.21 angstrom. So it is a little bit longer than the O2 bond. So you can do a lot of bond length predictions with um, an MO diagram that gives you a good picture of what the bond orders are for these molecules. Okay, so um, this is just another reminder that, that diamagnetism is the result of all spin paired electrons. These substances, and this is kind of interesting, they're, they're not drawn into a magnetic field and they're actually weakly repelled by a magnetic field. It's kind of why if you have like two magnets are usually like, they, they're like repelling each other um, slightly as opposed to being drawn in together. So paramagnetism is the result of one or more unpaired electrons where that, that substance is pulled into, drawn into the magnetic field. Okay, now this is where I wanted to show you, like these are the diagrams that you get on exams. And we tell you for B2, C2, N2, and their ions, you get these base diagrams. Um, and for O2, F2, Neon2, and any ions, meaning if you had O2, 2 plus, or O2, 2 minus, or if you had B2, C2, 2 minus, you can have ions of these things. And we'll go through a, an example of what it means. And in fact, one of them's here for C2, 2 minus. So if we were trying to fill in to and determine a property of C2, 2 minus, we want to go to this diagram here for C2 and its ions. And then we want to correctly think that what we're being shown here are the 2s and the 2p orbitals. And we almost don't need to do too much over here. Like what's over here is kind of for C2, 2 minus is 2c minus ions. And whether or not you fill in the left side almost doesn't matter because the questions are all about the MOs in the middle. But you have 2c minus ions. And now C without the minus looks like this, 2s2, 2p2. So C minus should be a 2s2, 2p3. And so we're gonna show a third electron over here. But like I said, th this is almost just like the accounting for the electrons of C minus and C minus being brought together and its orbitals are going to overlap. And so the whole idea of MO theory is just you're picturing, you know, two electrons in a 2s orbital, you have an electron here, electrons here, and then you have one other electron in the other p orbital that we've neglected sketching. And so you're just picturing these atoms and these orbitals overlapping with each other and their relative energies. So you just get the pi set, you get the sigma set, you get the relative energies based on um, this diagram. So this diagram is just showing us we get our sigma 2s and our sigma star 2s. How do I know that you get the, the, the sigma 2s? Well, it's the orbital about the 2s, so that's why these are 2s's. And then the antibonding goes up. So that's the star going up. And then I see two orbitals here because there's two. That tells me that's the pi set. That's the pi 2p. And then the next orbital is the sigma 2p, just because I get one sigma orbital but two different pi orbitals that are equal in energy for the pi orbitals. And I get my pi star 2p and my sigma star 2p. And so the stars here are just being this pi for the 2 and the sigma for the 1. And then for C2, 2 minus, I'm just looking at that saying, well, C2, 2 minus should have 2 times 4 plus 2. That's 10 electrons. And that's why I've shown 5 and 5 on either side for C minus. So I have 5 electrons over here. I have 5 electrons over here. So I have 10 electrons in the middle. So I go 2, 4, 6, 8, and then 10. And so I'm just filling in having a total of 10 electrons for C2, 2 minus.
And so then once I get the proper number of electrons into that diagram, I can then calculate a bond order. So the bond order would be a half. I have all the maximum number. I have eight bonding electrons. And again, just to make sure we're seeing that it's these two and these six, they're the um, um, electrons in the non-star orbitals. And then I have two electrons in the anti-bonding orbital, the star orbital. And so that gives me a bond order of three. And so C22 minus should look like a triple bond. Our bond anti-bonding electrons give us our lone pair. And then formal charges would be minus and minus. So this looks very much like an ion. We could have sketched a Lewis structure from, from just Lewis structure rules from chapter eight. And then also hybrid orbital theory, perhaps for you know, showing like a sigma and then two pi bonds from hybrid orbital theory. So good agreement for N2 and C22 minus in terms of triple bonds. Diamagnetic, so bond order of three, all spin paired electrons are so not drawn into a magnetic field. So you get these diagrams on your exam. You'll have this on the sample info packet so that you can label and use these diagrams accordingly. If we ask you something about, say, like O2, 2 minus or something, you'd use this diagram over here. And again, it's just the only difference is we have our sigma, sigma star 2s, then our sigma 2p comes next, then our pi 2p. But then pi star 2p, and then sigma star 2p. And so for O2, 2 minus, you're just filling in 2 times 6 plus 2. That's 14 electrons. And so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So for O2, 2 minus, we'd have a bond order of a half, 8 bonding, and then 6 antibonding for a single bond. And so it would just look like, again, this would look like the Lewis structure I think we would have predicted all along, O minus, O minus. So the key detail that we get from MO theory is really O2. Like, I think that's the biggest story of MO theory is the correct prediction of the magnetic property of O2, which is something that no other theory can show us. So I think that's pretty much why we're into this topic here in chapter nine. Okay, so here's another question. And again, just trying to show you kind of like how you can fill into diagrams. Um, what about O2 minus? So O2 minus where we only have now O2 with a minus charge would have two times six, but just plus one for that negative charge. That's 13 electrons. And so we can obviously fill in an odd count. We just want to make sure we grab the right diagram. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and then 13. So we have one unpaired electron for O2 with a minus charge. And so of course it has to be paramagnetic because all it takes is minimally one unpaired electron to draw that substance into a magnetic field. Uh, but that's really not what's being asked here. It's asking what the bond order is for this molecule. And so the bond order for O2 minus would be equal to a half. We have all eight bonding electrons, but our anti-bonding are just these two and then these three. So that gives us five anti-bonding electrons. So we end up with a fractional bond order, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with a fractional bond order. So a fractional bond order of one half, uh, or excuse me, three halves for this molecule, for O2 minus. Now, one of the things that's interesting with O2 minus, that's the superoxide ion. We learned how to name it back in chapter two, is the Lewis structure of this ion probably looks better if we kind of picture having that last electron right in the middle instead of being a lone pair electron. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have something that kind of looks like this for O2. I, we would probably never ask you to sketch a Lewis structure, but the key detail I want to show you is MO theory actually says you, can, you don't have to have a single versus a double bond. You can have a three halves bond. And then um, that just kind of puts the electron in the middle of the bond. And that actually gives each oxygen eight electrons. And so you can actually have odd electron counts within MO theory and show each atom satisfying the octet rule. And so um, if electrons can share, be shared between a bond, we have one electron plus the other bonding pair of electrons being shared, three bonding electrons. Um, that's actually allowing each atom to satisfy the octet rule. Um, so we still have, if we count, one, two, let me choose a different color, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons around each oxygen. And that also uses 13 total electrons. So if we just double count, that was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I've distributed all 13 electrons. So it kind of gives us almost like a better Lewis structure than we had the ability to write from 
Um, and, and a better way of thinking of molecules is having this fractional bond order where hybrid orbital theory, I think, was all either double, single, or triple um, bonds. Okay, one last thing that we could then look at is a molecule like NO. If you, it, you might recall for NO, 5 plus 6, that's 11 electrons. That, um, that for 11 electrons, we had done this Lewis structure before by saying, well, picture having 12 electrons and then thinking of which of the electrons you want to kick out. And so for the Lewis structure rule, we were kicking the electron off of nitrogen to come up with this Lewis structure here according to chapter 8 rules because that gave us zero formal charges. And if we did the opposite, if we kicked the electron off of the O atom, then this wasn't good because this was creating a negative plus in terms of our formal charges. So we didn't go with this structure. We'd go with this structure. Well, let's look at MO theory real quick. And, um, you know, I almost cut this out of the slides because I doubt they're going to ask you about what they call like a mixed or a heteronuclear um, diatomic molecule. But the only difference between N2 versus O2 um, in terms of their diagram, if we're picturing N versus O here, is that the O atom, be, because it's smaller, is a little bit more stable. Um, we keep the diagram that looks more like O2. Again, not, nothing you need to memorize here in terms of this diagram, but the sigma 2p is the next higher set of orbitals. So we get our sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, much like we did before, sigma 2p, pi 2p, pi star 2p. So the same basic order of our orbitals. And if we're putting 11 electrons in, we go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. Now, the really interesting thing is that just like with O2 minus, NO has a fractional bond order. So our bond order here would be equal to a half. And then how many bonding electrons do we have? So we have the max of eight bonding electrons. And then we have only three antibonding electrons. We have these two and then that one. So I have three antibonding electrons giving me a bond order of five halves. And so what that shows you is that a better Lewis structure would probably be one where we actually just go ahead and share that extra electron across the two atoms. And so instead of kicking a, an electron out of either, it's like, why don't we just add an electron to the double bond and have a five halves bond? So it gives us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we can have a Lewis structure that looks something like this and a Lewis structure that looks something like this. So where we have eight electrons around each atom and then a fractional bond order. So I just wanted to show you that fractional bond orders can show you where the two Lewis structures, we're trying to kick an electron, a lone pair off an atom. It's like, well, why don't we add a lone pair to the double bond? Um, so why don't we make a five halves bond instead, allows each atom to satisfy the octet rule, and then just gives us a fractional bond order. Okay, so um, I'll, we'll take a look at the demo next time so we can actually see that magnetic demo in front of us. Um, we will get into chapter 10. So the, the next series of um, kind of uh, chapters 10, 11, and 12 that we wrap the course up with go through gases in chapter 10, liquids in chapter 11, solids in chapter 12. One good thing to look forward to in chapter 12, we're just going to cover a few small details out of chapter 12. So we're going to primarily wrap up with 10 and 11, just a little bit out of 12. So we're getting very close to the finish line. Only seven lectures to go after today. So um, all right, so we'll wrap up here for today. You guys have a great day.